when you're starting out, right, you don't, you haven't earned the luxury to pursue your passion solely. Come on. Mm. Right? And what I mean, I, I want to tread lightly, but I need, to, I need the statement to stick because we... We hear a lot, like, you know, pursue your past and do what you will have to do. You haven't earned that right yet, mm. right? Like, you need to solve the money problem first. Mm, mm, mm. And then once you solve the money problem, then you've earned the luxury to chase your passions. Don't put pressure on your passion, because I promise you, if you put pressure on your passion, it's not going to be your passion very long. I never, I didn't come out and say, I want to build a brand, travel the world, like, talk about finances, talk, be a mentor. I didn't say that. I said, I'm going to pursue a career and something I'm good at that will make me money. Mm. Only once the money problem got solved did I have the room mm. to start dreaming. If you're drowning, you can't dream. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So like, like I think that's something that we, we really need to like let this, co this generation know, like pursue profits first. And once you do that, then you can focus on your passion. Yo, what's poppin'? You know what time it is. Your boy, Mr. J Hill. J Hill Podcast. Oh, man, this is a special episode. Um, yo, y'all know I've been doing, doing these entrepreneur spotlights, and this ain't one of them. <laughs> this, this, this ain't that. This guy, I mean, has been going crazy from what, what, what I've been seeing since I've been in Atlanta. I've been in Atlanta now for three years. Mm. I think I first seen him on David Shan's podcast maybe three years ago. Uh, and this is before y'all see the... The, the the big studio, the creative yeah, this studio. Is, this this is in like the white room with the yeah, white the background. White, yeah, this is this is that. You get what I'm saying? Uh, CPA entrepreneur. Um, I mean, you, I feel like you've been doing so much more than that now. Yeah. Uh, even getting into mentoring. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's it, it's so much, and we want to get into it. Um, and the thing that's that I like the most about your story that I just found out is that you have a story. As crazy as that sounds. Yeah. But Carter Cofield is in the building. What up, my brother? How you doing, King? That's Glad sir. to be here. The setup is crazy, man. I um, like it. Thank you, brother. So, yeah. um, you, I feel like I've seen you speak about your story a couple times, mm -hmm. um, but it's not the highlight and it's not at the forefront for some reason. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I fuck, my bad. Let me sleep. I gotta get you hey. good on the back. Pause, pause, pause. <laughs> let me let me get you let me get you right. I just remember that. Yeah. And we and we ain't gonna start over. We are gonna keep it going. <laughs> we, we need to see all this. Man. Yeah, get, no, give him the sauce, man. Give him the sauce. I need I to see it. all this. Yeah. Let me get you right, man. Let me get you right. Okay. Get you right. You know there you go. There we go. There we Just go. Light this motherfucker up. You feel me? <laughs> but yeah, man. Um, so I was talking about like your, your story, and I see it. I've seen it just by me, me doing my research, but mm -hmm. I feel like it's not. I don't feel like it's on the forefront, and I was wondering why. Like, do you feel like you talk about your story a lot? I feel like I talk about it. Uh, a decent amount, but I, I feel like you know it gets drowned out in the noise of the rest of the show because people come kind of come for tax strategies. But um, I your show, your podcast, huh? Your podcast. Well, I mean, in, in, in any in okay. any interview, you know. Okay. But I think the story is important because I feel like people don't care how much you know is that they know how much you care, mm. and they want to know who you are as a person before they go taking your advice to do something in their own life because they want to. I think people want to see, especially in like this day and age, where like. It's trust is not big right now. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Um, people want to know, are you taking your own advice? What have you been through? What have you accomplished before they get to taking your own advice and put it in their life? Mm. That makes sense. So I guess we could just touch on it a little bit. At 14, your mom's passed. Mm -hmm. At 16, your father passed. Yes, sir. You working at, at just a nine to five. Mm -hmm. um, I think your cousin come in. He's an entrepreneur at the time. He's yeah. like, um, he's like, what day is it? Yeah. He's like, bro, it's Tuesday. How you not know that? Yeah. like, bro, when you're doing what you love, and <laughs> every yeah. day is the same. And you're yeah. like, man, from that day on, you knew that you wanted to be an entrepreneur and do it, do it yourself. Well, I just knew there was more to life. Mm. I'm not going to say I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but that was the first instance that I realized that we don't have to just wake up, go work for somebody else just to make enough money to pay rent on the first and then do it all over again, right? I realized there was, there was more to life than just working a job. And I think that when my parents passed, one thing it did, it did a few things for me. One thing it did is it it didn't allow me to take a lot of risks because I didn't have, like, much leeway. Like, mm. you know, some people, like, you know, they, if their parents are alive, their parents can fund their, their lifestyle. They can kind of, like, you know, take more risks because they have something to fall back on. There was no fallback plan for me. So, like... 
I didn't have the luxury of taking a lot of risks as a young as a, as a young adult because I had nothing to fall back on. So it was like when my parents passed, it was like I'm going to pursue a career in a field that has a zero percent unemployment rate. Mm-hmm. Right? Everybody's going to need a CPA. So I even even selecting what I want to be as a as a professional was based off scarcity, not based off abundance. It was mm-hmm. like I want the most stable career I could possibly have. And so I was just like, all right, cool. Like I'm gonna just make enough money to like never have to worry about money again. Because after my parents passed, we were in a financial hardship. So it was like I want a job that I can stay employed, I can make a lot of money, bills don't be a problem. And you know, three, four years into my working career, I was like, it's really all I got to look forward to. And that's the day my cousin came in my room and it just hit me with the like you know, what day of the week is. And I'm like, how don't you know what day of the week it is? He's like, bro, because I love what I do every day. So the days of the week don't matter to me. And that was such a powerful statement because I believe that you cannot be what you cannot see. Mm. And that was my first time seeing somebody who literally woke up every day and just did what he wanted to do. Mm. And I was like, yo. And it showed me what was possible. And it's, you know, a, a God's grace that maybe 12 years later, from that story, I lose track of the day all the time because the days of the week don't matter to me because I literally wake up and do what I love to do every single day. Mm. Yo, one thing that stood out to me when you was when I heard you telling that story is the fact that you Googled what job is basically like never going to, like it's always needed, mm-hmm. right? And you found out on CPA because everybody always needs a C- CPA. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you Tax is going to be due whether the economy is good, bad, left, exactly. right, center. It's going to be... And you yeah. got it because of scarcity and not yeah. abundance. Mm-hmm. However, I feel like that abundance, those dreams, it, it's kind of what sets back the African-American culture. Mm-hmm. And um, where I'm going with that is like when I went to school, I went to college, I, I, I got my degree in sociology. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I love people. I love the, just the understanding of people. And now I'm using it doing interviews a mm-hmm. little bit. But that wasn't, I always joke like, bro, my, my, my degree isn't something that I'm going to make money in. Right. And I that's one thing I always tell people that's coming up in college. That's my advice. I say, yo, get a get a degree that you can make money in leaving school. Mm -hmm. And I know you for you, it's kind of like we on the opposite end looking on the opposite ends of the spectrum looking in. And we can find the the good on the other side. Right. So for you, you like, man, I just did something that I can make money in. Not not really dream or not, 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 not fulfill Mm -hmm. some abundance. And I'm looking at like, man, that was the smartest thing you could do. Yeah, and I think um, one thing, and it's my unpopular opinion, I'm going to say it right now. Um, when you're starting out, right, you don't, you haven't earned the luxury to pursue your passion solely. Come on. Mm. Right? And what I mean, I, I want to tread lightly, but I need, to, I need the statement to stick because we, we hear a lot, like, you know, pursue your past and do what you will have to do. You haven't earned that right yet, mm. right? Like, you need to solve the money problem first. Mm, mm, mm. And then once you solve the money problem, then you've earned the luxury to chase your passions. Don't put pressure on your passion, because I promise you, if you put pressure on your passion, it's not going to be your passion very long. I never, I didn't come out and say, I want to build a brand, travel the world, like, Talk about finances, talk, be a mentor. I didn't say that. I said, I'm going to pursue a career and something I'm good at that will make me money. Mm. Only once the money problem got solved did I have the room Mm. to start dreaming. If you're drowning, you can't dream. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, like, like I think that's something that we we really need to, like, let this this generation know. Like, pursue profits first. And once you do that, then you can... Focus on your passion, mm. but don't go. Don't, don't go for the passion first. Passion will keep you broke. Passion chasing the passion at the wrong time will keep you poor. Mm. So focus on the profit first. Then the passion you got a long time to live. The passion gonna be there, and then you've earned the right to say, "Hey, what do I actually want to do? Like, what makes me happy?" And then you can pursue it. You know, from somebody that's, I mean, I'm 33. Uh, you're a grown man. From from grown men, that sounds good because we've been through it. Yeah. You understand how it feels to be at the bottom and and and. And not be able to dream when you broke. We understand mm-hmm. that, yeah. right? But from a kid mm-hmm. that's that's going to school and like, you know, as young, we always hear like, man, it ain't about the money, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I just want to do it because I love it. And that'd be good until you turn 30 and it's like, yeah, that love ain't loving you back. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, that's how it be. Like yeah. with rap careers, with, with, with so many careers, yeah. like bro, yeah. you go into something because you're passionate about because you love it. Yeah. But what happens when your passion not loving you back? The way you think it should love you back. Mm-hmm. Now what, do you quit? And then you start resenting your passion because you're like, man, man, this is like, why ain't it panning out? You get angry, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you're like, man, why ain't it panning out the way it's supposed to? And and then you start to hate the thing you said you loved. Mm-hmm. 
And I believe that, you know, we should still, like, obviously tell our kids that they can dream and be able to do whatever you want to do. But, like, you need to figure out the money. Because, like, here's, here's what I tell people all the time. Starting a business is stressful enough. Mm. You don't need to put on how you, you don't need to add on how you're going to pay rent next month to that stress. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's hard enough starting a business, hiring, firing, you know, scaling, finding customers, finding leads, doing all these things that entrepreneurs have to do. With the first of the month rolling around, you don't got pay money, you don't got money for rent. Like, that's unnecessary pressure that you don't need to add to a plate that's already full. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I like I like the fact that uh you were saying I when you was giving like uh like tax advice and starting y- your business advice, you was basically saying like your nine to five try to make you be- think that. It's just nine to five. But mm-hmm. if the same people that pay you for nine to five will pay you from five to nine. Yeah. And like, I love that because it shows that in today's society is all like, quit your job, start your own business. And like, that's cool. Right. But, Does not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So I like the fact that you never said this, but in my mind, again, I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm interpreting like, yo, get a job mm-hmm. and then make start a side business from your job. Yeah, yeah. And then, like you said, then you can start paying off your personal your, your personal items and things like that because you have this side business. But I'm like, yo, at least you got a job you can pay bills, like yeah, you said. Yeah, you don't yeah. have to worry about yeah. the rent being paid. You can pay that. Yeah, but here's the thing, bro. Like, people like need to, people need to realize this. You go to work at 9 to 5. Mm-hmm. You got 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. Mm-hmm. That four-hour gap before you go to work. Mm-hmm. And you got 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Another four-hour gap after you go to work. So you got eight hours of working your job, you got eight hours working on yourself, and then you get eight hours of sleep. Mm. Like Jim Rohn said, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Like, stop being lazy. Mm. Like, just because you work nine to five does not mean you don't have time to do the things that you said were important to you. Mm. I didn't say these things were important to you. You said starting a business was important to you. You said learning about real estate was important to you. You have a four-hour gap before you start work and a four-hour gap after you start work to still pursue the thing you said you want to pursue and still have the comfort of your employer to pay your bills. Like your job is your first business partner. Mm. It's allowing you to fund your dream. But don't think that just because you work now, you don't have time to start a business. That's just you being lazy. Mm. Like when I was working, I was working 8 a.m. to, and I was working a bit for accounting. So it was long hours. I was working 8 a.m. to maybe 10 p.m. And then I would I had an hour train ride from downtown Chicago back to the suburbs where I would work on my business. I would get home about 11.30 at night. I would work on my business a little bit more. I would go to sleep about midnight. I would wake up at 7, be back at work at 8, right? And it wasn't fun, but I knew that I I wanted more. And if I really said, wanted like I said I wanted it, I have to put in the work and put in the hours to do it. Mm. And, like, whatever your job is paying you to do, other people who pay you to do that same thing. Like I was going to work and be an accountant. After work, I had consultations with people being their accountant. Mm. I didn't just quit the job and say, I'm going to start this business. I quit my job when my business matched my, w, my, my, my W-2 income. Mm. Making you know $5,000 a month from my job. Cool. My business at $5,000 a month. Making $7,000 a month from my job. My business is $7,000 a month. When I quit... It was like, okay, cool. Now my bills are still paid, and I know that my business can supplement my job. Mm. And now I'm gonna worry about paying bills as I try to build this business. Mm. So no, so you wanna you you went to culture now, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, no, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm curious because, bro, I want to go back. Mm-hmm. You lost your parents, both parents, by 16 years old. Mm-hmm. That instilled a will in you that most people don't have, a drive in you that most people don't have. Mm-hmm. Like you ain't have no excuse. You had to go get it. And I thank God for that lesson every day. Exactly. And 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 they say like when you lose something, you gain something as well. As mm-hmm. well, right? And I'm just trying to be careful because like these are your parents. Like this ain't no nothing. bro, like I mean, like yeah. I am good on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, but yeah. I say that to say you did gain a a a a strength in that, right? Not having no excuses, having to go get it. Mm-hmm. Most people, like you said, they have these excuses. And when you're coaching, I'm wondering, like, how do you coach in a way for somebody to understand? Because mm-hmm. it's easy for somebody that can relate to you, mm-hmm. be like, yeah, man, ain't no excuses. Like, yeah, man, you lost everything. I lost everything. I know how. I, but to somebody that don't have that in them, you mm-hmm. feel me? Like, how do you get through that? How do you convey that message? Yeah, so losing my parents was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Mm. And I say that wholeheartedly and I love my mom I love my dad but they they're they they did their, they did their job mm. right like when God took them away their job was done you know what I'm saying and for me losing my parents taught me more lessons than my parents could have ever taught me being alive mm. 
And it, it it strengthened me and it made me the person I am today. And and again, another unpopular opinion. People that have adversity have one of the best gifts if they open the package. Mm. And what I mean by that is if you ask God for resilience, if you ask God for um uh, what's what another word I'm looking for? If you ask God for resilience, right? He has to give you something to show your resilience. Mm. If well, you, you ask God for patience, you, if right? If you ask God for patience, He has to put you through things to show that to you're... make you a patient person, mm. right? So we have to realize the things. If like if we want to the, the the things that we say we want, what is the universe or God going to do to give us those things to make us have those personality traits? So. I wanted to be a person that didn't have no excuses. I wanted to be a person that was uh, resilient. I wanted to be a person that was determined. I wanted to be a person that um, was able to overcome any everything. So he said, if you want to be able to overcome everything, I'm going to take your everything. Mm. To show you early on that the thing you, you thought you needed the most, I could take it away from you and you'll still win. Mm. And so when I'm coaching other people, when I'm, I'm helping out entrepreneurs, things like that, the what I see, the people that are hardest to coach are the people that never been through anything because they never had to discover who they were when their back is against the wall. Mm. And so one thing I tell people, I've, I've, adversity is the one of the best gifts that you can have if you're willing to open the package. Mm. But how do you, because again, mm -hmm. you have been through adversity. Yeah. How are you, are you even able to take yourself out of it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and what you know through adversity to be able to coach these type of people. Yeah, well, I think again, I can only help. I, only, I can only help people that want to be helped, mm -hmm. and I can't want it more for you than you want it for yourself, mm. right? But um, I think one of the things I tell, I, I, I want to let every that when I coach people, I want them to understand is the, look back on the times in your life where you had the struggle, the strife, things you had to get over, and. Who did you need to become to get over that? Mm. And if you can get over something once, can you get over something again? Mm. Right? And so when things are hard and their business is not working and they want to X, Y, Z, good. Use it. Because oh, this is my favorite quote. I hope I don't butcher it. Um, when things get hard, you should get happy. Mm. And here's what I mean by that. When you are like... In the in the thick of it, things aren't working. Um, you know, the money's not not flowing in the way you want it to. You're working 12 hours a day. You're reading every night. You're doing all these things just to get to the place you want to get to, right? When most people are going through hardship, they're they're like, man, this is so, this is so hard. I can't get through it. You should get happy because once you get through it, guess what? The person that wants to have, the person that's chasing the things that you've obtained, they have to go through that same shit too. Mm -hmm. And most people in this day and age will fold under pressure versus strive under pressure. So when things get hard for me, I tell people all the time, like, I'm so happy mm -hmm. because when I get through it, the person that's chasing me, the person that wants the things I have, the person that wants my brand, the person that wants to pursue the things I want to pursue, they got to get to do that shit too. Mm. And I know if it was hard for me, it's going to be 10 times harder for them. Mm. So when things get hard, get happy because you're separating yourself from the competition. And also, though, I think you said this, like, when you have, like, I forgot exactly what you said, but basically, like, somebody that has nothing to lose, mm -hmm. right? You got everything to gain. Mm -hmm. But when you got every like, if you got everything to gain, you got nothing to lose. I mm -hmm. forgot exactly what you said. But yeah. to add to your point, when you're at that those lowest moments, the mm -hmm. only way is up, right? And it, it, I tell people all the time, it's just like life. Like if you understand life, you should be okay with anything that goes wrong in your, in your, in, in your life. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, bro, when it's thunderstorming and raining, mm -hmm. just look at the history, the history, and and and, and the weather of, of however it happens, right? Mother Nature, we know that mm -hmm. after it rains, the sun gotta come out. Mm -hmm. We know that. Same with your life. If you're going through something hard. You know that the only thing is coming next is something positive. That's just life. Like, and, and it might sound cliche, and I know it might, like, some people, it might be insensitive to some people, but like, yo, you have to understand that, like, when you're going through something, when you're going through something so traumatic, when you're going through something that that, that hurts so bad, embrace it. Mm -hmm. Because soon, soon after that, that's over, it's gonna be something that, that that's that's positive that happening. Yeah. This too shall pass. Mm -mm -mm. That's a fact. This too shall pass. And you just have to stay steady in the storm 
And remember, if you're if you're praying for if you're praying for flowers, it has to rain. You know what Come I'm saying? On, man. Like it has to rain. It got to. It has to rain. So, um, and that's, I think this comes from perspective, and I think perspective is one of the another gift that once you obtain, um, it will help you get further in life. Like, dude, every bad things happen. Like, the, think about this. Think about some of the problems you had when you the problems you thought you had at 21. Hmm. <laughs> you laugh at those problems. You wish you had those problems on, today. Man. Yes. You yes, know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like 10 years from now, you're gonna be laughing at the problems you're you're saying, the problems you're saying you have today because they're gonna be so small and minuscule. So just understand that problems create perseverance and you get stronger every day. Problems will never stop. You just become more equipped to handle them. Mm, that's fire. That's a bar. Yo, uh, I wanted to talk to you about your time spent in in the financial sector of the business, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You've been doing this for how long exactly? Uh, I've been a CPA for uh, going on 11 years. So, yeah, man. Okay, 11 time. years. I yeah. love that. In today's society, I think <laughs> post-pandemic, <laughs> so many people praise the, man, I only, man, I made a million dollars and only been doing this for six months a year. And I'd be like, I don't know if that motivate me, bro. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. Like, I've been doing this for a minute. Y'all might not have seen me. Uh -huh. And that's what I appreciate about you because even like three years ago when I seen you on a David Shane's mm -hmm. interview with the white backdrop, right? Mm -hmm. I could tell that you've been doing this. Mm -hmm. And that we have a lot of, and this is no knock against our um, pandemic uh, successes, but mm -hmm. we had a lot of people who got successful after the, or during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I watched that and the first thing that popped, I was like, Oh, he been doing this. He not just a pandem pandemic 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 renewer. Yeah, he not just yeah. a pandemic renewer. Like, and I was wondering, like, your yeah. thought process on that. Um, I believe a blessing too early is not a blessing at all. Mm. What I mean by that is, I know personally a lot of people who ran it up in a pandemic. Good for them, right? Amazing. Them same people who ran up in a pandemic are struggling now because they don't understand what it takes to actually build a real business. Mm. And what it takes to actually be an entrepreneur. Like if you if you come into entrepreneurship and your first experience is everything going right, when things get wrong, what happens? Mm. Now you don't know how to overcome adversity because when you decided to become an entrepreneur, everything went up. So um, I think that it was cool. Like you know, like people ran it up. But I, I'm seeing now a lot of people are getting out of the space because it's no longer easy. Mm. And so um, I you know I'm grateful that. I was an entrepreneur before, I was an entrepreneur during, and I'm an entrepreneur after. And um, I think that what's happening right now in the space is that people are getting, um, what do you call it? When People are getting sifted out mm. of the space who probably didn't really belong here in the first place. Mm. And um, I believe it's good, especially for our culture, because now due to those people who weren't who they say they were, and again, I don't think they were bad people. I think they just didn't understand how business worked. They didn't set up this infrastructure and systems to be able to fulfill on the promises they said they were going to fulfill mm -hmm. because they didn't have a team, they didn't have a back office, they didn't have things actually going for them. So I think that in, in, now we have, there's a big distrust in the space of coaching, online education, because so many people weren't who they say they were. But I think what's good right now is that people are getting sifted out and now the people who are going to stay are, number one, going to take a lot of market share, and number two, are going to reinstill the trust in the people that they should have in the first place from the online educators. Wow. But, I mean, we can't ignore that. The pandemic, that, it, it definitely helped with the business, right? Oh, hey, business was good. <laughs> and it is good. You know what I'm saying? And it is good. But, like, as a as a, as an actual business owner, you understand the ebbs and flows of a business. So, you're like, okay, I'm going to ride this, but I don't expect it to stay this easy for this long. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And one thing that people didn't do was shout out to my dog, Kenny Conwell. He say, when the money is good to you, be good to the money. Oof. And when the money was good to people in 2020, they weren't being good to the money. Mm -hmm. They weren't investing in the money. They weren't taking care of the money. They weren't watching their money. They were spending their money. And now they've created a lifestyle that they can't maintain because they weren't good to the money when the money was good to them. Wow. One thing that I can say, and my team and the people around me, like we were good to the money when the money was good to us. Mm -hmm. So now that things aren't as easy, doesn't matter because we took care of the money when we had it. Wow. How do we be good to the money, so to say, in these times? Stop letting your money be lazy. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, like, you want your money to work hard, as hard for you as you do for it. Mm. So with inflation at all-time high, 6%, 
um, and interest rates at all time high. We can't afford to just sit our money in a bank account anymore, bro. Like we have to find ways to invest our money, whether it's into the stock market, whether it's into real estate, or whether it's into our sales. Because um, shout out to Alex Mosey. He said, you know, he said this. He said, before taking money and invest it in the S P five hundred, take that money and invest it in the S P five hundred. And I'm like, that was a bar. I'm still in that house. You got one more time. I'm taking credit for it. But I think we just have to like watch our money and make sure we em employ it because if we don't inflation will erode it mm. yo i wanted to it, me doing these interviews and I, I've, I've been doing them for quite some time now yeah. and sometimes i feel like i overlook the small things because okay. I'm, I'm trying to go for the big conversation trying to go for the, the deepest the moments right yeah. and i think of you uh in a similar way because you talk about taxes like how to write off things how to have your money work for you so much mm -hmm. right i feel like you like the yeah. expert at that shit, right? <laughs> but I'm curious, yeah. right? I want, I kind of want to challenge you a little bit. Okay. What are some of the things that you think you overlook? And I'm better question. Let's start. What are some of the mistakes that a first time entrepreneur make when getting into the business? So before we get to the yeah, the yeah. hacks and the yeah, yeah, you can get yeah, 120 thousand yeah. credit yeah. for the you know what I'm saying? Like before we get into that, right? And we're talking to the people that ain't that might not be millionaires. You talk to a lot of millionaires, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But somebody that's first time into this entrepreneurship thing, mm. what do you think they overlook or or they they misstep on the, the most? The point of getting into business is to make money, and and what I mean by that is. People come to me and be like, man, how can I save on taxes? You ain't made no money yet. Mm. So, like, I think the, the common misconception is people want to start businesses for tax write-offs, but, like, they business ain't making no money. And we didn't, we not, you can't write off things if your business doesn't have income. Mm. So I think the, the, the biggest thing I see is people forget that the point of entrepreneurship, the point of starting a business is to make money first. Mm. Mm. So go, like, you don't have a tax problem, bro, until you have a money problem. Mm. And if you ain't solved the money problem yet, go solve the money problem and then come to me and then we'll, I'll help you save it. But if you ain't got no money, I can't do nothing for you. I think I seen, I don't know if it was Wall Street Trap or somebody talking about this because I've, was a victim of that as well. And I'll explain. You go, you get these LLCs or you get this LLC and talk about these tax write-offs. And this might be a little different. Mm. But if you have so many tax write-offs, it, what it's telling the government is you, you, you ain't make no money. Mm. But then when you're trying to get mm -hmm. money from mm -hmm. other people, right? I don't want to give you no money because if I look at your documents, you ain't make no money. So yeah, you ain't had to you ain't had to uh, pay you ain't had to pay tax nothing like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah. You got away with it. Yeah. But now when you're trying to get funding, yeah. you can't get funded because your papers show that you ain't make no money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, break why it down I, for me. Why would I trust you with my money if you can if you can't be trusted with your money? But I made money, bro. I, yeah. I just finessed the government. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Help, yeah. Help me out. Like, well, yeah, no, for what, sure. What's and, more important? And and, and and first of all, you don't have to choose. You can have mm -hmm. both. Right. There are certain tax deductions that get added back to your income when lo when loan times come. Right. And that main deduction is depreciation. So depreciation is a tax write off that when you file taxes, it wipes out your income. But when you go apply for a loan, they add it back to your income mm. so you can have the best of both worlds in the same year. Oh, shit. OK. So, for example, um, if you were to purchase a vehicle for your business, right? And your business actually makes money, guys. Let's not forget that. Make money in the business. But you used to purchase a vehicle. Um, let's say it's a $100,000 vehicle, right? And you financed it. Didn't have to put no money down. This year, if the, if the vehicle weighed over a certain amount, you would get to write off 60% of the value of the vehicle. So if the vehicle costs $100,000, you get a $60,000 deduction for depreciation. When you go to apply for funding, they will add that sixty thousand dollars back to your income oh, wow. for your for your application approval because they understand that depreciation is not an actual expense because you'd have to actually pay money to get that deduction. So they're going to say since you since the money didn't come out of your account for this deduction, we're going to add it back. Mm. Same thing for real estate. When you purchase a real estate property, you get to depreciate the value of your real estate property. Even if your property goes up in value, the government will give you a tax deduction as if it goes down in value because it has wear and tear. So, for example, you might buy a $100,000 property, and if you implement certain strategies, you can write off 30% of that. You can depreciate 30% of the property in year one. So you will get a $30,000 deduction for the depreciation of your property. That de deduction will get added 
back to your tax return. So if you find the right deductions, you can lower your income so you don't have to pay taxes, but you can still get approved for loans at the same time. Sheesh. Yeah. That's a game. So you don't have to you don't have to pick either or. Okay, so you can have both. You can have both. both. Yeah. Okay. Yo, you was talking about before we got started, you was talking about um you about to build a studio and you about to get another spot or whatever. Build yeah, a studio. yeah. Oh, crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was curious about that because you could like write that off. If you got a studio on your home. Yeah, 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 yeah. How much, how does that work? Yeah, for sure. So I'm moving into a um, two-bedroom penthouse in Dallas, Texas, right? So you're moving there? Yeah. This isn't just for content? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm moving there. I'm moving there. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 okay. yeah. But like um, strategically, right? So I was give you the whole play. And I'll give you real numbers too. Um, the apartment is going to be about $8,000 $8, a month, mm -hmm. right? And... I'm going to live there, but I'm also going to build a content studio in the same apartment, mm -hmm. right? What most people would do, they would move into uh, the apartment. They would li they would live in the master bedroom, right? And then they would turn the secondary bedroom into the to the studio. What I'm going to do, I'm going to turn the master bedroom to the podcast studio, and I'm going to live in the secondary bedroom because it doesn't matter because the whole apartment is mine. Mm -hmm. But the bigger the space that you dedicate to business the bigger the deduction, right, that you get. So, for example, the master bedroom represents about 30% of the apartment. So because I'm turning the master bedroom into 100% business use, 30% of my apartment is now represented by my business. Mm. So now I'm going to be able to write off 30% of the $8,000 every single month via the home office deduction because I'm turning majority of my apartment into business use. Wow. So if we take 8,000 times 30%, that means that I'm going to write off $2,400 per month times 12. I'm going to get a $28,800 tax deduction for turning a piece of my apartment into a content studio. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And then I'm also going to be able to deduct all the money it's going to cost to build out the studio. It's probably going to cost like fifteen dollars to $20,000 to build out the studio with the right cameras and the right lighting and all that stuff. That $20,000 is also going to be tax deductible in my business as well. Wow. So I'm going to probably, to, to build a content studio in my apartment, the IRS is probably going to give me a $48,000 write-off for doing so. Yo, you know what's funny about that? Because, um... And now I'm going to get into my selfish questions. And, and yeah, might get, ask my friend, bro. Might get, <laughs> might get more in interesting. So yeah. the crazy thing about that is um, going through this journey, and I'll get a little vulnerable, I guess. Mm -hmm. You don't want to bring people into your space, mm -hmm. right? It's like and then you, you want to have your own studio. You want to yeah. want to pull up looking like big dog. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Things don't, don't work out that way, mm -hmm. right? And I feel like more people need to know that because... That make me feel better about my situation, to be it's honest. Because now it's like, uh -huh. oh, so this can be a benefit on multiple ways. Yeah. Saving money and getting tax deductions. Yes. But I never I never thought about it like that. I'm thinking about perception. Because we all, I'm just being real. Like, we, yeah. we, we want to build mean, this brown brand. It's perception. That's how we get lost I, bro, in from that. The, from the real talk, you know, you know what changed my mind? Wallow and Gilly. Mm. Have you ever been to there? Okay. I haven't. Okay, so. I know you have. Though, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and it, it changed the game for me. I mean, obviously, I knew the tax benefits, right, um, of building a studio in your own apartment because you get to write off where you live, and that's dope. But, dude, like, I went to their studio. They record in they, the same grandma house they used to live in when they was a shorty. Wow. And it's just a regular crib in Philly. And the back room is their podcast studio. Oh. Which way they generated tens of millions, millions. of dollars. <laughs> and guess what? They had Kevin Hart in that in that studio. They had Jim Jones in that studio. They had some of the they had uh Brent Fire, some of the biggest artists in the world mm. were okay recording in a studio in a grandmama house. Wow. So like it just changed my thought of like of the perception. I don't gotta try to flex for the people if they really rock with me. And they really want to do my show, they're gonna do the show. Mm. They're gonna do the show. So, like watching Wallow and Gilly do it, I was like, oh, okay. I'm, I don't have to go invest unnecessary money in a new studio build out if unless I'm super ready to do so. Mm. And so that gave me the peace of mind and clarity I needed. I wanna say thank you because that just helped me out. And because even and I talk for the smaller creators or whatever, when you don't have the name, you want everything to be 
It's like you want to do more mm -hmm. because you want people to pull up and 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 say wow. You want people to pull up and be like, okay, it's worth it, or I'm I, I don't feel bad for coming here. You mm -hmm. get what I'm saying? Yeah. But the fact that you said like Gillian Wallow did it, and I'm like, mm -hmm. you naming people. I'm like, cause I'm thinking, man, I can't have a uh I don't know a, a Jay Z or, or or whoever. I can't have a Brent Fire walking well mm -hmm. here. But now, like you said, like if they rock with you, they're gonna rock with you regardless. Yeah, yeah. Well, focus on you until the focus is on you, bro. Ooh. Like real talk. Like you like, and I think. Real talk, we can get deep on this. It's it's just another, uh, it's another, um, it's a stigma of imposter syndrome. So like because wait 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 <laughs> wait 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 hold up keep going keep yeah, going yeah yeah no real talk because like if you don't believe in yourself and you don't believe your show is is good or you don't believe that um you've earned the right to have some people in your studio you're gonna spend unnecessary money to do something because to make you feel more validated as a person which is why in our culture we have people buying watches and jewelry and whatever to overstimulate for the fact that they're not confident or they don't really have the, the they don't really have it the way that you think they have it so they're gonna buy things to fake it until they make it so jay hill was like you have all the confidence in you and you know you the man and you know you have one of the best shows out here you know you put in the work you've been doing this for years the studio don't matter because you've worked on yourself so much and you've worked on the, your show so much that people are going to pull up regardless. I don't know. I want to argue this, but I can't because you make so much sense. <laughs> so, so me, I'm thinking, you know, I'm just like perfectionist. I wanted to look a certain way because yeah. I, you know, my content look a certain way and I got to yeah. live up to the standard. Yeah. But that makes so much sense, bro. And it's like, I never thought that I, like, if you ask me, I ain't have no imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah. But maybe so, because clearly if you care that much about what somebody else think when they come in, mm -hmm. then how confident are you? And just to let, not leave you on a boat, I, I still have a positive syndrome, bro, and I've been doing what I've been doing for 11 years. Damn. Because if, and it's just a matter of like wanting more, right? I feel like if you don't suffer from a little bit of imposter syndrome, I feel like you just don't care enough about getting to the next level because... As you grow, you're going to still compare yourself to where you want to be. Mm. And you're here. Where you want to be is here. This gap is the imposter syndrome because you ain't there yet. You know, and it's okay because you want excellence. Now, if you were comparing yourself to who you used to be, there wouldn't be no imposter syndrome because you don't want more. Mm. Cool. And, and the way you get over imposter syndrome is by just by putting in the work to feel so confident. Like, on my way over here, bro, I was still studying on my way over here. Mm. Different tax strategies, because I didn't know what we were gonna talk about, and I refused to, like, not have an answer. So, I I think if you don't suffer from imposter syndrome a little bit, I don't think you care enough. Yo, that's crazy. I think I was talking to my daughter, and um, I was asking what she, she danced, and she was like, she's nervous. This is a while ago. And I'm like, that's good. Because when you care about something so much, you should be nervous. You should. Right, because, like, Shit, bro, I've I done podcast. I need a million of these. I ain't gonna lie. I got a thousand videos on my YouTube. No exaggeration. Probably 1,100. No exaggeration, bro. I still get nervous sometimes on conversation because I know I study for it. I prepare for it. And I and 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 I want it. I want my work to be present on camera. Mm -hmm. I, want it, I want you to know that, man, this nigga. Yeah, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I be nervous. Yeah. Like, damn, but I never thought about it like that imposter syndrome. Damn, bro. When the last time you think you felt it? I mean... I mean, uh, okay, yeah. So I've I feel it right now um, because I so in our in our company in our in our in our um, financial advising and tax company, we're we want to serve a higher end client, right? Because we've been working with entrepreneurs, you know, six figures, and now we want to work with higher end client. Because you talk to a lot of millionaires, That's yeah. Not... But like we now we want seven to eight figure clients, right? Okay. Um. To, to bring more value. So I'm like, okay, I really, I had to talk to myself. I said, if somebody's making 10 to $15 million a year, do you want, like, do you have what it takes to really talk to, to give that person good advice? Like, if somebody's making, like, you know, and, and, and so it was a challenge for me. And this is recent, right? Because me and my business partner talk about all the time. Like, all right, we wanna, we wanna, we wanna work with some higher tier clients. And who do we have to be for, to attract those clients? And so now it's making me get back in my bag and get back into my knowledge to be like, all right, well, I have the strategies to help six-figure entrepreneurs. I have the strategies to help seven-figure entrepreneurs. But what happens if an eight-figure entrepreneur comes to me and say, hey, Carl, I need help with saving on taxes and building my investments and building an estate plan? Like, do I have what it's like? And I had to talk to my partner. I said, bro, I don't know. And like me and I had a real conversation. Bro, I know who you are. He said, I see more in you than you see in yourself. You got this. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So like... I go, I'm going through it right now, bro. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. like, I think that, again, if you're not chasing more, 
then you won't have this problem. That got to feel good, though, but not to interrupt yeah. the story. Yeah. The fact that you have somebody that's on your team. Yeah. You can call a friend and be like, bro, I see more in you than you've seen yourself. Yes. I have a phenomenal business partner, um, and um, we actually joined our companies together. Um, so I had my accounting firm. He had a financial advising firm. And we combined to create our company, Melon and Money, where we have a podcast, we have, um, you know, classes, but we also have a service-based company. Mm -hmm. So when people come to us, like they can learn or they can just hire their financial advisor, their their tax expert, their insurance agent, their estate planner, all in one company. Mm -hmm. And so the people that need these all-in-one services are seven to eight figure entrepreneurs. So I have to become the person that's able to serve them. And... Um, it's been it's been it's been a whirlwind, but like again, it's been um it's been fun to get back into like studying again. Bro, I got so many questions, and I apologize if like no. we're gonna get to the taxes though. Bro, like, like you can, whatever, because like, yeah. like, I'm I'm just curious, bro. Yeah. Um, when it comes to like doing taxes for all of these millionaires, right? Mm -hmm. Again, I think I represent a certain part of the world where like the non-believers slash people like. I'm from the hood, and yeah. I ain't never seen... Me too. Uh, South you know Chicago, you know bro. Yeah. I come to Atlanta. I'm fresh in Atlanta, yeah. so I'm new to all these entrepreneurs, successful black people, yeah. and it's still a part of me that's skeptical, like, ah, oh, niggas is full of shit, right? <laughs> but I know it's real, because I be hanging around like, you. I, yeah. I, I see it. I be yeah. like, okay, this yeah. might be real. Yeah. But anyway, I say that to say, how much of it is capped? And you wouldn't know. You don't have to say no names. Yeah. But like, it's so many... Like, I was I commented on a video, like, everybody in Atlanta millionaire. Like, yeah, like yeah. bro... It, Here's what I'll say. They are millionaires. How much they keep okay. is different. Like, 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 it's not about how, much, how, about how much money you make. It's about how much money you keep. And we've seen underneath the hood of some high-level entrepreneurs, and we're like, yo, like, okay, I see what the top-line revenue says, but I'm seeing that, you know, it's the negative at the bottom. Like, what's, what's going on? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, again, it's back to the thing that people have, when the money is good to you, you have to be good to the money. Mm. And some people are maintaining a lifestyle they shouldn't try to be maintaining right now mm -hmm. because they were making a lot of money back in 2021, but 2024, they have the same expenses, but the money is different. Mm -hmm. And so we have to consult and coach those clients on like, hey, like this is what this is the financial plan that you need to do if you want this money to sustain, right? Like this is the type of like 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 you need to treat your investment account like you treat your expense account just like rent is doing uh, on the first of the month and your your car note that lamborghini is doing the first all that this investment the contribution that we agreed to at the top of the year we're not going to stop that if we invest in twenty thousand dollars a month into this account so you can save on taxes and build your net worth that's what we're going to do mm -hmm. and you're not going to say like oh, i don't want to do that this month but you okay with paying for the lamborghini no like you you have to understand that like um treat your investments like a bill and they will take care of you. If you treat your, like, like we, we can't neglect the necessary and investing is not something that is an option. It is absolutely necessary. So a lot of people are making the money, but like how much they keep a different store. And I'm, I'm investing. That's on a high end and a low end. Yeah. I would assume. Yeah. Like yeah even yeah. for somebody that's not made, maybe, okay, maybe not hundred dollars a month. If you commit it to investing a hundred dollars a month, that is a commitment mm. and that is a bill. I want you to look at it just like the same way you wouldn't like not pay your phone bill. Yeah. Don't not invest that hundred dollars a month into your Roth IRA or whatever. Like, do you have to do that? But how do we get to a point where we are able to do that though, bro? Because we can't, we can barely afford rent nowadays. You feel me? So like, you talking about investing shit? Yeah, it's necessary. Like, it has to. It's mandatory. I barely got enough to pay rent. And what the, my initial thought is? Well, okay. Well, what do we need to give up in order to go up? Hmm. Are you willing to? take a step back in social status to take a step forward in financial status. Come on, man. That's the conversation we got to have, right? Because, like, and Alex Amosi says this, like, everybody's going to die. Mm. Like, the, the what people think of you now, 10 years from now, you're not probably not even going to know those people. Mm. So if you have to, like, take a step back in life and give up the car or give up going out and whatever to sustain your investing, then that's what you got to do. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And like, what are you, cut? what are you willing to cut off in order to take off? You might have to cut out drinking. You might have to cut out Netflix. You have to, like I'm again, you know, I'm no excuse person. So like, it's just like, yo, like we got to figure it out. The, 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 in, in real talk, like for us and cause I, I don't want to give these 
and give this advice without giving my own experience because I, I want people to know I'm talking to myself through them. Mm. I had a conversation with my business partner the other day. I said, look, bro, the way these expenses is going right now, like we, go, we have to chill on some things mm. because I refuse to not be able to, to make a reinvest into the business or make the investments that we have to make. Like that's not an option. Mm. So if that means we got to like cut back on something or look at payroll, like we got to figure it out. We're, we're not going to do is be so in our own ego not to cut back on expenses to do the things that we that are mandatory for the business. Mm, this is good, bro. This is this is way better than I expected. <laughs> Yo, when did being a millionaire? Because we talk about cut back on the social status, right? To to build our financial status. Mm -hmm. I feel like honestly, in 2024, being a millionaire is kind of like a mass, aka a social status. Now, mm -hmm. when did being a millionaire become a social status more than it became <sighs> about fi being financially free? As crazy as that sound. Yeah. Um, or do you feel like it is, though? I think, respectfully, people need to stop looking at a million dollars as a lot of money. Mm. Because a million dollars is not a lot of money anymore. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's more money than most people have. But, like, it's, if, if, if a million dollars is your only goal, I aspire you to dream bigger. Okay. So let me ask you, not million dollars, being a millionaire, I feel like yeah, okay, it would, yeah. Being a millionaire is nowadays it seems not for me. Mm. I ain't get there yet, but mm. at one point in time, the conversation was about six figures, right? Hundred thousand dollars a year, yeah. like that was the conversation. <laughs> but in Atlanta, yeah. I see like, hundred thousand dollars ain't shit. <laughs> can, can, can I can I give you my first ahead, experience, ahead, bro? Ahead, like, this is, cause I, I, I want I want to make sure I I let the people know because like again, real talk, like I did not become a millionaire before like coming to Atlanta and seeing the millionaires. Cause I didn't, you can't be what you can't see. Yeah. I didn't know it was possible. Yeah. I'm like, yo, like million dollars, whatever. Like I came to a conference in Atlanta in 2020. It was a circle of CEOs first conference. David Shans was interviewing Neo, uh, him 500 and all them on stage. I never, I never forget this, bro. This this reshaped my, my perspective on money. He was like, yo, like, you know, um, I started hanging out with y'all. He was, uh, uh, Chance was talking to Neil, and it was like, I started, I started hanging out with y'all. And I and I remember, you know, texting y'all like, man, I had my first uh, six figure month, right? <laughs> and then they text back like, bro, you good? Like, do you need some help? Like, 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 like they, they were concerned. They were like, they were, they were like, yo, like, you need like lights on? Like, you need some help? Like, we got you if you need something. And, and he said it jokingly, but like it, it reframed the way I think about money. I said, is there a world? where making six figures a month is like is emergency mode meaning like 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 you the, the lights might, might not be on and that was that that again reshaped my my thinking i was like oh they play a different game mm. like they look at money different and i think at least for me when you see something as being unattainable you can never attain it mm. So the moment I stop looking at a million dollars as being a lot of money, just walk right past it. Mm. But while it was still an unfathomable thought, I was like, "Well, I can't get there." But it was it, what helped me is hanging around people that were that 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 were making millions and millions of dollars. And I'm just like, and I'm looking at, I'm I'm adopting their belief. They're like, "Yeah, man, like a million, like 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 they try to do a million dollars a month." And I like I'm like oh okay so a million dollars no longer a lot of money and then it is able to happen so I would just encourage anybody and I'm not trying to say this to not be relatable but I'm saying it worked for me when the moment I stopped thinking that a million dollars was a lot of money it became so much more attainable mm. and I think that people are able to do that whether it's a hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars just whatever your goal is hang around people that make your goal look small and it'll be more attainable for but you. But I can't get around these people, Carter. I Like, it sounds easy, right? Yeah, you yeah. was in the line and you was able to get around these people because of whatever you were doing, you were successful. But well, I paid to get around these people, first of all. There we go. Talk about that. Okay. All right, I paid to get around these people because, and like, that's the thing, like, people are uh, who are at a higher level than you, they have more to lose by hanging with you than they have to gain by hanging with you. Mm. So you have to put it in their best interest or make it... Um, make it a, a positive narrative for them to want to hang out with you. And whatever you have to offer, you have to find a way to offer it. All I had was a credit card and some money that I was like, all right, well, if I can't, if I haven't earned the right to be your friend, 
Let me pay to be around you mm. until I earn the right to be your friend. And that's the way I look at things because I feel like if you have enough money to solve a problem, you don't have a problem. Mm. So it, 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 so that's how I got around these people. And I, I know it's hard, but like people say like, oh, I'll have the money. Well, figure out some, what can you offer? Do you have a platform? Mm. Like, do, like you have to add value to these people. They're not going to hang around you because if the narrative of you are – the five people you hang around, if they let somebody that's if they make they millionaires, they let somebody that's making a hundred thousand hang around, they all they they are yeah. coming down, they're, they're dropping. Yeah. So you have to like, what can I do to make it worth their while? Mm. So even on a higher level, mm -hmm. I'm um I'm asking this, and I'm gonna go back to my question, but I, yeah. now I'm now I'm being selfish again. Yeah, <laughs> it's your show, bro. Like, even, you can do even, this. even on a higher level, you have to do that because. Like now, like where I'm at, right? I feel like a lot of people that I hang around is people that I'm trying to help out. Mm -hmm. And now that you said that, it's like I have access to other people. Like David Shannon is like a friend of mine. I could, I could call him a friend. Mm -hmm. But he, we be joking on his show. He's like, man, how much? How often do you call me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I saw that. I yeah, saw that. I saw that. I saw and that, I saw and that, I'm yeah. like, in my mind, I'm like, man, I'm building my own thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's almost necessary for me to hang around. This is no those. almost. Take that almost out. It is mm -hmm. absolutely necessary. Mm. For you to hang out with those people that you have access to, um, because in my time, in, in my mind, I'm like I'm building mine, but I'm trying to help the people on the ground as well. But like you said, not and again, I hate to have this conversation, but people that get it, they get it. Mm. That's bringing my stock down, even mm -hmm. though I'm trying to help them. Mm -hmm. When I have a whole, I have access to a whole nother atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I need to invest in that, mm -hmm. and it don't have to be. It could be time. It could be money. Whatever. I'm like, damn! I never even think about it like that. Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like, I feel like you you have to be selfish to succeed, and then once you succeed, you can go back and help the people that you want to help, mm. right? Like, I believe in a 33 percent model, right? You spend 33 percent of your time with people who are on a higher level than you. You t you spend 33 percent of your time with people who are on your level, and then you spend 33 percent of the time with people who are who you're lifting up, right? Mm. And you can just divide that. Um, you can spread it out evenly. I went kind of, I, I, I did not take my own advice. I said, I'm going to spend a hundred percent of the time okay. with people that are doing better than me. Cause I want to get there faster. Like I, I don't, I don't have the time to get rich slow. I want to get rich fast because the quicker you get to your dream life, the longer you get to enjoy it. So mm -hmm. I spent 80 to a hundred percent of my time with people that were doing better than me. And then once I became, a uh, uh, or the closer to that level or became a prominent figure, then I was able to pull the people up that were beneath me. But how many times have you, have to, have you tried to help a friend out? They didn't take your advice. And you're like, bro, what are you doing? And, it's be, and like, get, get this. It's because you haven't, and this is, I'm talking to me, I hadn't got the results <laughs> That were good enough to make them take my advice seriously. I'm about to leave. <laughs> oh my God. Bro, you hit the nail on the cuff. And they'd be like, okay, so you're gonna listen to I'm saying the same thing, yeah. but they don't see you but at if, 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 if Barack Obama called them up and gave them some advice, they would take it and run with it. Mm. If you gave them some advice, they they would do it because you haven't become the person that puts the urgency under them to make them do what you say. Mm -hmm. So you me, I had to spend more time becoming a person of statue so that what I say matters. You snapping, bro. You know what I'm saying? And so that's the advice to everybody. You want to help the people around you become so big that any word that you tell them, they take as fact. Mm. Because Elon Musk can say something and then a, a homeless man can say something. They can say the same thing. Same thing. But you go take Elon Musk's advice for who he is. <laughs> Damn, bro. You know what I'm saying? Shit, bro. That's crazy. All right. Going back to the, the um, mask thing. Do you think that, because I personally think that being a millionaire nowadays, it's, it, it, it's, it's definitely like, it's more of a mask or a social structure or a social construct than it is financial. Mm -hmm. I feel like, especially with the branding, it's mm -hmm. like, again, I don't know how much people really make it. I don't. Yeah, but yeah. I feel like people brand that millionaire thing or multi-millionaire thing as if like, this is a, a status quo type mm -hmm. thing. And I was wondering your perspective on that. So I think the moment I stopped looking at, I started looking at net worth over revenue. Let me explain. For real status, right? Because that, that's what the wealthy people hold themselves to. If you are, if you consider yourself to be a millionaire because you made a million dollars, 
you could spend you could spend two million on ads and make a million dollars and be broke mm. and be a million dollars in a hole. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that million that the millionaire status is holding a lot of people back because again, I'm behind the hood of these businesses. Some people are making like you know make one point five million, but if you're spending a million on ads. You only have half a million dollars left to run your business, and now you only keep like a hundred thousand. So you, yeah, you're a millionaire, and you're trying to live like a millionaire, but you're only really taking home a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars of that one point five million dollar business. Mm-hmm. But when you start looking at net worth, which is how much investments you have minus the debt that you have, that is true millionaire status. Meaning, I have a million dollars of assets that I can liquidate if I want to. And I have now I have a million dollars in cash, mm-hmm. right? So I once I start shifting my 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 mindset from I want a million dollars of net worth versus a million dollars in income, it really changed the narrative for me. And I, and I would encourage people like that should be the new millionaire goal. Like mm-hmm. not a million dollars in revenue, not a million dollars in income, a million dollars in net worth. Meaning that if you were to leave today, your family will have a million dollars to separate with them uh, amongst each other when you pass away. Wow, I like that. Okay, so I can, bro- again, I can ask you about how to save money on taxes. Mm-hmm. I can do that, you get what I'm saying? But I want to speak to my, my people No, this is, dude, this is, I'm, I'm having a great time right now. I want to ask you, when you do people taxes, uh-huh. where are some of the, the missed opportunities that you see the most? Where is people spending their money the most where they can cut back on? Mm-hmm. Like specifically, we see people say food, right? Mm-hmm. We see people spend a crazy, egregious amounts of money on food, mm-hmm. something like that. Like, what are you seeing on people tax? Uh, per profit and loss statements. Yeah, profit yeah. and loss statements where somebody might not be a millionaire, right? Somebody might be a regular average Joe, and they like, man, I don't have it. Mm-hmm. What are some things you could look and be like, well, you actually do have it, and you're spending it here. What What are some of those things that you're seeing? Um. Or have you not done regular people taxes in a long time? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's, that's the real right there. That's the real. So I I, I can't give you, I don't think I, I, it, it would be um, as helpful for me to give the things that people can cut back on. But I, I can say the the people's returns I look at now that are making a lot of money, I can tell you what they're spending on mm. that allows them to make the money. I like that. Right? So number one, believe it or not, is personal development or training um, for them and their teams. So people at the highest level are still investing in education, period. Like it might not be the typical mentor that we see in the, in the black community, but they're like investing in like a, a, a one hour call with Grant Cardone is $100,000. I know that because I seen it on somebody's tax return. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And they're investing crazy amounts of money and in information. Like they need to get the answer fast. And they understand that, Life will always charge you more tomorrow for what you don't know today. You're going crazy, bro. No, I'm, 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 I'm seeing, I'm seeing it. Fact, and yeah. I'm like, yo, and like they're doing whatever it, time, it takes to collapse time from what they don't know to what they do know. And, and if I give anybody any advice from people who return, I see six figures, seven figures, eight figures. They're always investing in information or answers that will take their business to another stratosphere. That's number one. Number two, marketing and advertising. People don't know you. They can't flow you. We know that. And um, one time, one thing my mentor said, um, shout out to Myron Golden, it's reshaped the way I look at um, advertising. He's, you know, people like, you know, we're always like, I want to find more customers. I want to be able to like, I need, I need to like find more clients. He said, instead of spending all your time trying to find clients, why don't you spend more time making yourself more findable? Mm. And so, like they're investing in advertising and investing in brand building. So they're investing in podcasts. They're going to other people's podcasts. They're building their own podcast, which is why we're building a studio because like, like if you are the most well-known, you'll get paid the most. Mm. So there are a lot of uh, high, high earners are investing in marketing, advertising, and social media teams to build their own brand. And those are the two, like top two things I'm saying on people's profit and loss statements. Or, you know, it's crazy because that make me think about um, the missed opportunities because, like, I'm always, you seen, you came in here, I just give you the game. Like, you feel yeah, me? Yeah, but, like, yeah. everybody always be like, bro, you need to start a mentoring program or coaching. And it's like, bro, I really just tell people, like. Yeah. That's good, though. You're getting practice. Right? And I think that, real talk, one of the worst things you can do is try to monetize something you haven't mastered. 
And what happened in 2020, people were just like literally buying people's courses, consuming it, and then, and then charging people to regurgitate something they just learned last week. We don't, we don't do that. So I think the fact that you've waited this long and you've decided to master your craft of, um, you know, podcasting and content, all that, like now when you do decide to start teaching, you're going to actually be good at what you decide to start, to start, to start, to start teaching. And you're going to actually be able to help people get results because you didn't try to monetize something you haven't mastered yet. Mm. And you know what else I think about now um, that, that you said that it's different between knowing it and being able to teach it. And I learned this from Shane. I think he might have said this one time, but like, because like I, bro, I could do this in my, lit, like not even exaggerate, yeah. though. This is so easy. Yeah. Like, I can do this in my sleep. I've been doing it for so long. Way before I came to Atlanta, people just getting to know me in Atlanta. Yeah. But it's a difference between knowing how to do it and being able to teach somebody how to do it. And that's what really separates you. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I never think, even when you said it, like it's good because it's not about we ain't talking about, I don't want people to get lost in translation. It ain't just mastering being able to set it up. Mm -hmm. It ain't just been mastering knowing how to do the lights and, mm -hmm. and the cameras and all that, but mastering how to present it, yeah. how to teach it yeah. so somebody can get the results. Mm -hmm. Damn. Yeah. It, it, it takes mastery. And that's what you should, you should master before you try to monetize because just like if you was on a basketball court, you might be at a hoop, but teaching somebody how to do the move that you just did. He's like, just do the move, bro. I, I, I just I just did it. Just do it. Like yeah. it, it doesn't work like that when you're teaching. You know what I'm saying? You have to, have to do this first. Oh, they left hand is not strong. So we have to build up the left hand because the crossover requires them to do the hezzy with the left first and they haven't mastered that. And and that's it's crazy because that's what separates like great players from great coaches. Mm -hmm. I was watching uh, Shannon Sharp said this uh not too long ago. He's like a lot of times the goats, like goats, mm -hmm. have a hard time coaching because when somebody doesn't do something as well as them, it's like, bro, why can't you just get it? Just do that, it. That came easy. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. do it. And it's like, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's a lot of times people fail because, like, you think people... Talking talking about uh, imposter syndrome, but another another way of that is... Uh, what What's the word I'm looking for? People don't see the greatness in themselves. Mm -hmm. In themselves, and 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 where I'm going with this is when you don't see the greatness in your, in yourself, you're un, you're unable to teach others. And what I'm where I'm going to is like, for example, this is how I had a problem with this. Because I look at what I do as regular, mm -hmm. when I'm trying to teach it to somebody else, I'm saying it in a language they don't understand. Because for me, is I don't see the greatness in myself. But if I understood how great. I was at what I did, mm -hmm. then I will understand that I need to break this down because everybody can't get this. Like you said, when somebody go through, when you go through the pain, right, mm -hmm. and you you feel good because you're like, yeah, y'all got to go through this too. Yeah. It's only going to get worse. Yeah. You feel me? But you understand that it was something in me that got me through that fire. Right. I know everybody don't got that. Yeah. Same with whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, yo, I know that, man, I got to this point because I was great. Mm -hmm. So when now when I'm teaching somebody, I'm able to go from A to Z because I, I understand that you might not have what I had in me, if that makes sense. No, for sure. It's, I mean, like, I think the saying is, is it's impossible to read the label from inside the jar, mm -hmm. right? And when you're naturally great at something, because you're naturally great at it, is the reason why you don't know that you're great at it because mm -hmm. it came so easy to you. And mm -hmm. we, as human beings, associate things that come easy That's as great. things that like and are are not of value. So mm -hmm. because I'm able to easily, you know, like because I'm able to easily make complex financial topics easy for people to understand, like, I just I thought shit was easy. But other people can't do that. And our greatest gifts are often the things that we either ignore the most or don't realize because it came easy to us and it, but it won't come easy to other people. So that's why, we, that, that's why we say, if you want to like learn how to like, if you like want to start a business, and you don't know what to start. The question to ask yourself, what comes easy to you? That's hard to others. Period. How do you, how would you know that though? We got to start, you got to like do some self discovery. Entrepreneurship is the best self reflection and discovery journey you'll ever take. Let's talk about that. bro. I, I personally, I don't, I'm scared of entrepreneurship. Okay. <laughs> so I say, I'll say this. <laughs> okay, talk about <laughs> so it. So listen, bro. I, uh, I feel like I've been an entrepreneur my whole life, right? Yeah. Unconsciously, bro. I swear. Uh -huh. I've always had like dead end jobs. Uh -huh. So even like when I first started hosting on a mic at, at parties, I would have jobs to pay my bills. Yeah. But I, my focus would be on what I love to do. Yeah. So I, that would cause me to get fired a lot, quit a lot, and things like that. Mm. But I didn't know that I was an entrepreneur. I say that to say this is my first year 
coming up there, like I haven't had no job this entire year, right? Like my podcast been, oh my God, I, this yeah. is crazy. Yeah. I can't even believe it, whatever. But like yeah. the first time, like my podcast been paying my bills. But it get extremely scary at times. Mm -hmm. And like, I never asked for this. I never want to be, like, people look at me like, man, he independent podcast. Like, yeah, he did yeah, it. He yeah, had, yeah. Bro, I will get a job at a radio <laughs> station. You have no idea. Like, I don't know how I got into this position. Yeah. I don't want to be that person that's, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. like, I don't want to be the the, the, the the poster child for independent podcasts. Right. right. I don't want to be right. that. But right. somehow I landed in this position. Mm -hmm. But it, it made me realize that, yo, I've always been this, but that's why I could never keep a job. Yeah. How do you recognize when you when you meant to be in the position that you probably don't want to be in? I mean, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a not. Uh, first of all, I, I feel that wholeheartedly, right? Do you? I, yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> You've been but an I, entrepreneur forever. No, 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 I mean, I, bro, but yeah, but like, see, I didn't, didn't know I was gonna be who I am now. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's what's going on? Like, I'd be waking up, like, what's happening? Yeah. Um, but I, I just like you just you just you just end up it, things end up start started working out. Like again, you didn't just. Say I'm a podcast tomorrow and quit your job. You've been doing this for years. Yeah. This is the first year you say I'm going all in, right? I'm going all in on my dreams, going all in. Not like, purpose, not intentionally. <laughs> hey, man, hey, look, let me tell you something. Real talk. If you don't, if you don't, God will close, God will push you through doors you are afraid to walk through. You wildin', bro. That's what happened. And then you try, like, I tried yeah. to get no, 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 cut, cut, cut it off. No, 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 no. You're done. You're done. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Uh, Damn, yeah. I tried. Yeah, no, no, bro. God will God will push you through doors you're afraid to walk through you're afraid to walk through. And you'll start seeing it like you'll start like, like why I can't this I, man, like what what's going on? And then it's just it just happens, right? And 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 I think that um we just have to be like your time is gonna come whether you're ready or not. Mm. Right? If you're if you're if your time comes and you're ready, it will promote you. If your time comes and you're not ready, it will expose you. Mm. So your time came where it was like, I have to go all in. But guess what? You had already put in the work. Yeah, you had already put in the work. Yeah, so ready. now we can push out these jobs. <laughs> I was ready. You're, you're yeah, ready. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, ready. Yeah, yeah, you're ready. You're, right, you're, you're right, ready. You're right. And so that's why we have to always prepare before the promise because when the promise comes, if you're not ready, it's going to expose you. If you're ready, it's going to promote you. And that, we don't. We, we can't afford to miss out on an opportunity. This is so good. We ain't even talk about taxes. Yeah, this I mean, is so it's, good. It's this, is, this is good. I'm just like, damn. This is the conversation I didn't know I needed. Like, but that's success, though, bro. They say success. success is when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. So all the time that you prepared, mm -hmm. that helps you get. It, it, it helps you be ready for the when is your time. Mm -hmm. And it's like that. That makes sense because like, bro, I was fired. I had to. Real talk, bro. I, I don't think I'll talk about this much on camera, but. It was a point when I moved to Atlanta, I had two jobs and mm -hmm. working in tech. I probably was making like 350. I never made that much in my life, boy. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's, 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 that's a lot of money. Going yeah, from yeah, yeah. not making six figures yeah. to making 350 on the work. in the corporate sector. Not, yeah. And then my podcast was going crazy at the time. Yeah. So maybe close to four, bro, that's insane. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. insane. To losing both of my jobs, having to do the podcast. Getting to do the podcast. Mm. Facts. Getting mm -hmm. to do the podcast, mm -hmm. that was one of the most scariest, the scariest moment of my life, bro. Mm -hmm. Because when you get it, when you make a certain money after not seeing it, mm -hmm. your worst fear, my worst fear, was losing it mm -hmm. and not knowing how I'm gonna get it back. Yep. That was like my biggest fear. And it was like God knew that and he exposed it. He was mm -hmm. like, okay, cool, let me show you. God puts the best things in life right on right on the other side of your biggest fears because he wants to see if you're gonna let faith overcome the fear. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So he's gonna like put it like, okay, this life you want is right on the other side of this this decision. Mm. Are you gonna let your faith overcome your fear? Or are you gonna let your fear overcome your faith? This is crazy, bro. And I'm and I'm only able to speak on this because I went through it time and time again. Like, like, since we're being transparent, like me and my business partner coming together it was fuck was really scary for me because I already have a business that was doing well. He already has a business that's doing well. We have to come together and I'll split everything. That's real talk. That's scary. Mm, mm, you know what mm, I'm saying? I can imagine. So, and, and like, I'm talking to God like, yo, like, is this, was this the right decision? Like, am I? And like, me and him talk about it all the time. Like, yo, like, shit's scary, scary. And so like, the only reason I'm able to speak on it eloquently is because I've went through it time and time. And time again, and the more you go through it, and you start to recognize when it's happening, you get less scared. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So now I'm like, okay, well, like 
This I, is bad I'm again. nervous. I'm nervous about it's that feeling again. I know I'm moving in the right direction. I might not. I might be uncomfortable, but I know I'm moving in the right direction. We good. This is fire, bro. This is so good, bro. Yeah. Yo, did you have a? You was at an event not too long ago. Was that your event? That was our event. Yeah. And and that was the sign that guys like, yep, you're doing the right thing. I'm like, yes. <laughs> Hold up, bro. Wait, what? that was like an event for entrepreneurs. Like a, it was like a, uh, almost like a um award show. Award show. So it was, it was it's the um we we call it the, the the Grammys for Black Wealth. Um, the Melanin Money Awards. We highlighted um everybody, all the top entrepreneurs in the space that won their category, and everybody showed up from. Um, you know, Neo was there, Trap was there, uh, um, Aristotle, uh, Aristotle all, all the top entrepreneurs in the space were there, and we were highlighting them for their achievements. And um, it was one of the biggest events we've ever thrown, the most expensive event we've ever thrown, but it was confirmation that, like, this is something we want to do. Like, and, and now it's getting bigger than we ever could have expected it. Um, but that, that was a scary moment, bro. We spent a lot of money on that event, and it was like, we don't know if it's going to work. And... We was fearful, but we said this is something we said we're gonna do, so we're gonna do it. And then the the aftermath was absolutely insane. So it was one of them moments again, faith over fear, and it really worked out. Did you make your money back? And then some. And we got it's not about the money; it's about the relationship and the standard that we set for black excellence was um, more than anything that we could have imagined. And Trap said it when he was on stage; he 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 received stock market expert of the year, which he deserved. And the two things I loved about that moment, one, him and Aristotle are topping their game and they both congratulated each other on both on the awards that each other received as a showing of collaboration over competition. Mm. That was number one. Number two, Trap said, he said, everybody needs to be here. He said, we out here running to the, you know, no disrespect to BET, he said, we out here running to the BET Awards, but like we the people that shift the culture for when it comes to financial literacy and education and entrepreneurship, we the people that, that that do this. And like to be real, he was like, we make more money than them anyway. Mm. And and it, it was just to see the 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 space adopt an idea that we thought was gonna be good, that was everything we needed. I asked you, did you make your money back? Because I was gonna go for the impact because like far as that, I seen it. I'm like, yeah, I ain't gonna lie to you. I look, I'm like, damn, bro, I don't never get invited to none of the good shit. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, but that's I promise how you, you know. invited. I promise you invited. But that's year. how you know yeah. when something is good. When, yeah. when you when you have that feeling of being left out. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's how I was like, oh yeah. But I was just curious if you did or did make the money back. That impact is important, and it's just as good as money. Mm -hmm. And and but I was wondering like, how much do as somebody that's putting an event together like that, how much are you looking at the impact versus the return and investment far as money wise? Money wise. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that one of the good lessons I can give your audience is there there are brand decisions and there are business decisions, mm. right? That was a brand decision. It was good. Though. Yeah, it was great. Great brand, <laughs> great, great, great brand decision. Yeah, Shout out to that. That was not my idea, bro. That's my partner's idea. I give him all the credit. I was like, bro, you sure? You yeah, that was a brand decision, right? But you need to make a lot of good business decisions first before you're able to make a brand decision. That was a $400,000 event. Mm. We can't make that brand decision without making really, really, really good business decisions. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So there are two different things. I think that like early on entrepreneurship, focus on business decisions. And then you can make incremental brand decisions over time, mm. right? Because there's a difference between branding and marketing is holding on the conversation. But... But yeah, that was that was that was that was a, a branding decision. And some branding decisions will make you more money than business decisions will. But it, it's going to take time. Mm. You have to be patient. This is good, bro. Yeah, this is this, bro. This is this, this is great. You gotta do it. We gotta do this again. <laughs> yeah, bro. yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely do another. Yeah, one. We'll definitely do another. Let yeah. me ask you. Um, um, I'm sorry. Before you get out of here. Yeah. You doing Invest Fest? I am doing Invest Fest. That's what I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, bro. Like, I was just curious of when it comes to like this entrepreneurship space. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's like podcasting because like we see like podcasting is is is, is going to be the future, mm -hmm. right? I'm wondering like where do you see it in five ten years? Podcasting? No, no, like entrepreneurship. Oh, dude, we're in like, like we're still on the brink of it. Like, you in, think so? in, in my yes, we're still on the brink. Are of we it, talking African American or African Americans specifically? Okay. Right. Um. Well, and here's the thing, like. There will be a place for jobs and there will be a place for businesses, right? Like. All the business does is create more jobs. I have 30 employees right now, which is crazy to say out loud, right? Um, I think as a culture, we are on the brink of 
entrepreneurship in the black community. And I think it's going to be a beautiful thing as it evolves, as things become easier with AI, as um, people like do like more, like more money is going towards podcast and, 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 and social media influencers than going towards radio advertising. In a few years, we are going to have all the power. People are not going to sit. There, there are more. There were. I saw an interview the other day. There were more people watching somebody's live stream than they were watching CNN. Wow. Over an eight-hour period. That's crazy. That's crazy. So I personally think that we're on the brink of it. I think that there's still more to obtain. I think there's still more to learn. I'm excited about what's to come, and um, it's just you know it's fun. Man. Entrepreneurship for me is a way to impact lives a way for me to, um, you know, uh, become who I'm supposed to be. And it's a game, and I'm playing to win. Carter, last question, I promise, bro. Yeah. I promise, bro. Yeah. I just, so my brain is just going there. <laughs> Give us some game. You talked about um, somewhere, you talked about a couple times how spending money fourth quarter, December 31st, oh, is yeah. probably smart because you get that. Yeah. You, you spend money for next year, yeah. and you get it written off for this, this year. year. Yeah. Okay. Give me some entrepreneurship slash podcast game for my independent guys out there. I've witnessed this a little bit mm -hmm. where I was able to get big checks mm -hmm. for the up and coming year at the end of the year I was in. Yeah. How do we go? What's the smartest way to go about entrepreneur to go about advertising dollars? If I'm talking to entrepreneurs, I'm talking to businesses mm -hmm. in the fourth quarter. Yeah. So I think one of the best strategies that I can give, especially I think somebody in, in the particular space of like solo um, and trying to build up is um, at the end of the year, prepay expenses and postpone revenue. Mm. What I mean by that is if you know you have to upgrade your studio and buy new cameras, buy new equipment, whatever, in December, load those expenses on a credit card in December. Mm. Because you, you you might not need to spend you might not need the equipment for January, February, and March, but just pay for it in December because you're gonna need it next year anyway. Mm. And then that way, let's say you spend an extra fifty thousand dollars on uh, 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 yeah, I'm gonna use that as a number. Let's say you spend fifty thousand dollars on all this equipment and stuff that you know you're gonna need for next year, and you buy it in December. And now you're gonna be able to recognize that write off in December, even though you didn't really need to spend the money until January, February, and March. So we're front loading expenses on a if you can zero percent interest credit card. Because we want to get, we want to capture that tax deduction today, even though it's not for next year, right? And if you can't, if you if you want to, at some, if you want to double down on this, any money that is going that's going to be paid out. So I would try to like get as many contracts, um, as 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 possible at the end of the year. But I would tell them pay me on January first, because they pay you in December, you got to pay taxes on that money in two months. But mm -hmm. they pay you in January, you got to pay taxes on that money for thirteen months. See, I'm looking at it, I was looking at it opposite. So I'm looking at it um, the way I shouldn't be looking at it. As an entrepreneur trying to get advertising dollars, mm -hmm. I'm like, yo, I December is a perfect month to reach out to entrepreneurs for, for, uh, for um, I don't know, if they trying to do advertising on my podcast. Mm -hmm. I reach out to them in December. I can get a fat check in yeah. December for, for, for next year. Yeah. But then I'm going to have to pay their taxes. But again, it's, it's a double-sided coin. But again, remember, first rule of business, we're in here to make money. Right. Period. Right. So if, if if I'm you, I'm do I, I I would do it this way. You're right. I would hit up as many entrepreneurs as I can to set up contracts for next like for next year and have them pay you this year. But hey. Pay me for the year. Pay me for the year. Pay me right now. Yeah. Is that you you pay me ten thousand dollars for advertising for yeah, next year? <laughs> you you get a ten thousand dollar write-off, mm -hmm. right? And and then now you get the influx of money. But what you also need to do, you also need to be doing what I said as well, prepaying all the expenses for next year. In December, at that same time, so you might you might get sixty thousand dollars worth of checks, but you also might spend sixty thousand dollars on a on a car for all your expenses next year. So now you you've got money, but you wiped it out. That's smart. Shit, I could just you can get that bag. You could pay your rent for the entire year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, like, like, bro, like, that's something we do. Like, we you know when our clients are hiring us, like, yo, if you just pay for the entire year, right now, you get a write off for that this year. Like, so and our minimum investment is thirty thousand. If they want to, if they want to hire us. So just pay us 30K this year, and you're at a 37% tax rate. Just by paying us this year for next year's service, you're going to save $11,000 in taxes mm. just by doing that. And you think that's, I'm, I think that's a smart 
thing. Why don't people been think of this? Like, cause me, I'm a I'm podcast independent, yeah. and this is something that I've learned again because I've I've had experience getting advertisements, and yeah. they paid me at the end of the year, yeah. and I learned why. And and but I'm like, bro, more people need to like go out in December. But I feel like a lot of people don't be want to spend that money. When, 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 when if you're a tax savvy and you let them know spending the money before the end of the year is gonna help them save money, that's a sales tactic. We use that all the time. Like, mm. you can pay us in January or you can pay us now. Mm. And we will take the money. And then what we, we, we're also doing, we're like, all right, who el- who can we pay now for next year as well? Mm. And so it's just like a cycle of, yeah. you, know, you know what I'm saying? So we're getting more money, but we're also prepaying stuff for next year. So it's, it's, it's even and out. Wow. That's fire. I appreciate you so much, man. Yeah. For the people that don't know, let them know how to follow you, how they can support you, what you got going on, all that. Yeah, yeah, So, um, uh, Cofield underscore advisor on all social media, uh, media channels, except YouTube, uh, is Melanin Money. And I will, um, give you, um, the links to anything that, that we're doing, um, that we want to promote on yeah, in the yeah. show. What you got? Is, is you promoting something right now? Yeah, well, we, you know, so, uh, we, we are, so, uh, the end, of the, the end of the year is coming, as yeah. we talked about, and we want to help entrepreneurs minimize their taxes during tax saving season, right, which okay. is the last half of the year. So we do uh, this five-day training called the Multiply Your Money Challenge where we teach people how to save $50,000 in taxes. We also teach them how to take that money that they're saving and invest it for next year because the more what people don't know is the more you invest the less you pay the IRS there are ways for you to invest more money and save on taxes at the same time so we teach them how to save the money on taxes with the extra 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars we, we help them save then we teach them how to invest it like real estate cars things um, like that right well no we teach them how we specifically stock market stuff oh, okay. oh so, wow so if I, we go help you save the money on taxes now you got a bigger now you got more money to start investing because people ask well where do I find the money to start investing stop giving the money to the government Mm. Right, so we teach them how to save money on taxes first, and then we teach them how to take that money and start investing it. Um, so it's a five day training, and I'll add the link to your show notes as well. I'm gonna um, let you go. I'm just curious. Yeah. Do you? Because when you talk about the stock market, do you partner with people like Trap and like Aristotle? Um, so my partner is actually a financial advisor. Okay. And he's a licensed uh, investment wealth manager. Okay. Because I be wondering, uh, like, why don't you? We all just yeah, work together. Yeah, yeah, like, we. And that's all. And that's all. That's all in the works. Trust me, that's all in the works. But um, there's a difference between short term investing and long term investing. We focus more on long term. They're more short term. Short-term. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was just curious. Yeah, was, yeah. Man, I appreciate you again, brother, for yes, real, sir. man. This is great. Oh, man. My guy, Carter Cofield, Mr. J Hill, J Hill Podcast is a wrap. We out. <laughs>